This podcast is brought to you by OEC and Collision Link Plus, a new product upgrade for collision repair shops designed to improve parts ordering, save more time, and capture more profits. Learn more at oeconnection.com slash collision link hyphen plus. Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Body Shop Business, the podcast. And first off, I'd like to thank our friends and sponsors at OEC and Collision Link Plus. And today I have a special guest, the one and only Laura Gay, Consolidation Queen, President, Owner, CEO, Head Honcho of Consolidation Coach, which is a business that kind of holds the hand and coaches body shops through the acquisition process when they have a potential suitor or buyer that wants to buy them. Hi, Laura, how are you? I'm great, Jason. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. I'm so excited and jazzed up about it. You're welcome. And there's no one that knows the consolidation industry better than Laura. As I said, she is the owner of Consolidation Coach, and she used to own body shops and sold them some years ago. So she is on the cutting edge of what's going on in the collision repair acquisition space. So Laura, I want to ask you, first off, last year, you told me that consolidation started sort of as a slow, meandering, casual drive through the country and then slowly but surely became the Daytona 500. It really ramped up fast. Um, and I, you expected a slowdown at the end of the year, I believe, and it did not slow down. So sitting here today, 2022, first quarter, how would you characterize the consolidation market right now? So it's changed a lot, even in the last 30 or 60 days. Um, we have so much going on, you know, we're, I want to believe that we're at the end of COVID, um, but maybe it sounds like it's ramping up again in other countries with a different strain, which obviously adds a, a considerable um, thought of, of, you know, what direction, you know, kind of gets your mind wandering. So one of the factors that's impacting uh, consolidation right now is tax reform. Um, so last year we were super concerned about it and that's why consolidation quite frankly sped up because based on what was being proposed last year, it was going to truly negatively impact owners' um, net returns, what, what they really were going to have in the bank when it was all said and done. But fast forward to today, to today it, it's pretty much off the radar. And the reason that it's off the radar, I think we all know, is, um, you know, the, our president is, is probably not one of the favorite, you know, people in the country. Um, he's not very well supported or what he's doing is not being supported right now. So consequently, it's not a good time for tax reform. Additionally, we're coming into an election season this November. Another reason, you know, for not having any tax reform. Uh, so I think we're in the clear with that. Um, but I think the next challenge that, you know, we're looking at that's changed the landscape quite a bit is this Russia-Ukraine situation and the potential for war. Um, like any time we've had war in our country, it gets investors scared. And why do we care about investors? We care about investors because they're the ones that are ultimately behind the consolidators and the consolidators' money and how they're making these deals and where they're getting their cash from. So they're watching things very closely. And there's a host of other little small, um, you know, chess pieces that are, um, you know, going on also. But but that's the meat and the potatoes of what's changing. And, and it still continues to be a very strong, fast moving bull market. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you have a lot of sellers out in the market. You probably have more sellers right now than you've had ever. Uh, because shops are just, quite frankly, fed up. I mean, they are just tired of, of having, um, fighting with insurers, um, challenge with getting parts. You know, they've got 15 cars on their lot that they're waiting parts for, getting no support, um, challenging with, uh, or challenged with staffing and finding good people. And um, it's just a very frustrating time to be a shop owner, quite frankly. 
last year at one point, you told me that this was a buyers and sellers market and it had never been that way ever, that it was all the buyers and sellers market. There was plenty of buyers out there and there was plenty of shops willing to sell. Would you still characterize the market as a buyers and sellers market? I absolutely would. And I absolutely say it's probably grown because there's more consolidators um, or private equity buyers out there now than there was six months ago or a year ago. So as that number grows and as we have, you know, more shops, you know, selling, it just continues to be, you know, a, a wild uh, situation, for lack of better words, um, just un unreal um, that in activity, it just seems like, and, and maybe you can speak to this uh, better, but it just seems it's press release after press release. Uh, plus, in my little network, I, I just hear all the time about all these shops that are, you know, have sold. Did you hear that one sold? Did you hear this one sold? It, it's just, it's, it's absolutely wild. So, Laura, tell me the characteristics of the ideal target shop that a consolidator would want to buy. What is that shop? Give me a profile of what that shop is. So typically it's a shop that's got, you know, 10,000 square foot or more that's doing two to $3 million in sales. That's DRP friendly. Um, ICAR gold is huge because consolidators can't buy ICAR. You know, that's something that, you know, you have to earn. Um, and tenured employees, they, they really value tenured employees because they don't have like this you know, like a lot of people think, they, they don't have this huge calvary of people, you know, in a, in a tractor trailer waiting to come to work at the shop and take over. They, a big part of what they're buying is the people. Um, so they really like seeing shops that have tenured, long-term people um, and shops that run autonomously without a manager. But if you don't check all those boxes, doesn't mean that you're not um, a, a fit and um, these parameters, per, for lack of better words, they, um, they, depending on markets, you know, like if you were in New York, there's lots of parts of New York and New Jersey where, you know, there just aren't shops that are 10,000 square foot. You know, the shops are like a big shops, 8,000 square foot in parts of New York and New Jersey. So um, what I'm trying to say is there's some outside the box uh, bending and uh, thinking through this and that just because it doesn't fall exactly into that doesn't mean that um, you're, you know, you're not a fit. I think you said that the window of time for a shop that perhaps is not ideal for a consolidator right now to make itself more attractive to a consolidator, that window of time is shortening rapidly. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if a shop right now today wants to sell, but, but, but they need to do some work on making their shop more attractive. Do they have the time and what do they need to do? And can they do it? So do they have the time? I, I don't know. You know, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, with the war. You know, hypothetically, you know, if they stop buying like they did, you know, when COVID happened, you know, they, they stopped buying for six or eight months, maybe a little longer for some of some buyers to get back in the game. Um, you know, if, if that happens again, obviously that's going to extend the window of time, you know, so let's just say they stop buying for six months. And right now I think we've got probably 24 to 36 months of, you know, strong buying ahead of us. And then it's going to taper off. You know, if, if they stop buying for six months, then that's going to extend the time period, I believe for the same amount of time. Um, and when I say it's going to end, I'm not saying it's going to be like, er, it's over. It's, it's, it's going to just, it's going to taper off. And what's going to happen is they're going to have their footprint that they're seeking. They're going to have the network that they're seeking. And then they're going to, you know, changing their focus and direction of things. So Laura, I was telling someone in, in the building the other day about this consolidation trend. And he said, well, are, are there going to be any more shops left? Obviously, there will be. Not everyone's selling. Um, why wouldn't a shop want to sell right now? And um, uh, uh, are, are are there going to be enough shops left when the, when the dust settles to to handle the repair volume out there? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, that's a question that has created a lot of hysteria in consolidation and in the consolidation world, right? So, you know, back when I sold my shops back in 2015, like, and you may remember the news was like, you know, uh, it was kind of like the, the bad guys are coming. The bad guys are coming. You know, you got to get ready for consolidation. They're going to put you out of business. The, you know, the, 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 the end of the world is coming. And quite honestly, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, as shop owners, we're so used to being beat down, you know, by uh, in all directions that a lot of us really truly believe that. But honestly, you know, here we are in 2022. And um, I think in the end, there's going to be plenty of space, plenty of room for an independent shop. Um, do I do think they're absolutely, if they're going to be an independent shop and they're going to remain, um, you know, competitive and, and whatnot, they're really going to have to reinvent their wheel. They're going to have to reinvent how they think about things, how they run their business, how they manage their employees, what their niche is going to be. I think they're going to have to truly be a niche-based shop. And there's a lot of people you know, that just don't like dealing with corporate corporatization or corporate companies, you know, for anything. They want to deal with independent, um, entrepreneurial based businesses. Um, and I think, again, there's going to be continued um, uh, need and desire. And those shops are going to continue to do great. They're going to have great sales. Um, and a lot of those you're going to see, I think, long term are going to be non-DRP, more of like a concierge. You know, you've, you've heard of concierge medical, I'm sure. Um, I think a lot, much like a concierge uh, doctor is. Um, I think that's where we're headed. And um, quite frankly, I'm, I'm kind of already mentally there where I feel like, you know, if my car gets wrecked and it's actually happened to me, um, I kind of realized, you know, just like with medical, you know, hey, they're going to pay 1500 for the MRI, but I'm going to have to shell out another 500 I think that, like, I'm already there. I'm, I'm good with that. So if my car gets wrecked and it's got to get fixed, I'm okay with paying the extra money. And I think that mentality is going to continue to um, just embed in the American mind that, you know, if you want quality, you're going to have to pay for it. You know, otherwise you're going to get marginality. And I'm not saying that in a negative way, but just, you know, that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of the American mindset, you know? You know, Laura, one of the most common questions I get is, what is my shop worth? How do I figure out my shop's worth? Is there an easy answer to that? What factors go into that? Another great question. And I will tell you, there is not a uh, black and white short answer to that. There's so many variables. Uh, quite honestly, to determining the value, um, a lot of parts play into it, uh, financials, what your true profits are, um, you know, what is, is, is the business, uh, does it have 20 people that are, are working there and, and, the, and it's autonomous, Dicar Gold, does it have OEM certifications, where it's physically located, um, how many locations, is it just one or is it multiple? There's just so many variables that it's honestly hard to say exactly, you know, a black and white answer. Um, but that's one of the things that we offer. And many clients come to us just to get evaluation, just because they want to know what the business is worth. And they're trying to decide, you know, do I want to sell or do I not want to sell? And many times they want to do it themselves. And the valuation gives them the tool to, you know, be able to know where to start because otherwise, you know, you're, you're literally in a room with the lights turned off trying to figure it out. And uh, quite honestly, a lot of the consolidators will, you know, throw out a, a, a pretty large sum of money and you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. I just hit the lottery. Um, and I actually have a client right now that that happened to. And um, he was kind of being strung along for quite a long time trying to get to close. And then he called me for help and I'm like, praise the Lord that you did not move forward, that, you know, this didn't close because they had, you know, shortchanged him quite a bit and, you know, we're getting him straight now. But, but that's such a huge piece of it is understanding the value and then you can make good decisions. It's kind of like, 
you know, if you've got medical, uh, medical issues and you don't know what's going on, you just know you have medical issues, you know, you're having headaches, you're having this, you're having that. And, and you're just kind of like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to make good decisions without good information. You know, you bring up a good point. Selling your shop, you probably don't want to go that alone. I don't know if a good analogy is trying to sell your house by yourself. Probably not a good idea, but right? I mean, you don't want to go through this process alone. So I'll tell you, there's most, the reason I got into this is, you know, I found that most body shop owners, they're reformed body men, they're reformed painters. You know, they're people that were in the trade and wanted to have a, a they wanted to be an owner. They wanted to own their own shop. I mean, I, it's the American dream, right? So, um, Consequently, those guys are amazing at fixing cards. They're amazing at making customers happy. They're amazing at doing what they do good. They do great, actually. But they don't have a whole lot of business knowledge. And that's basically what or how my business was born because I have that. You know, I'm a body shop chick. You know, I understand operations well. I understand you know, equipment, what it takes to get it done. I understand you know, what the sales should be per square foot. Um, I understand all that stuff, the things that they're probably, you know, may be struggling with. I understand, you know, reading a profit and loss and helping them get their profit and losses cleaned up so that they are more palatable. Sometimes that needs to be done. Um, but more importantly, they, those body, former body men and former painters, they have no knowledge when it comes to, to, like you said, like selling your house or, or any type of, mergers and acquisitions. That's what they call this business. And that quite honestly is one of the biggest challenges that they have. They just, they make a lot of decisions uh, or choices just because they, they don't feel like they have any resource. You know, maybe they don't know about me. Maybe they don't know about others. I, I don't know, but um, I agree that those are the ones that need help. And then there's lots of body shop owners that are true businessmen or businesswomen that have that knowledge. And you know what, those are the ones that probably could get the valuation and do it alone, honestly. I mean, I was basically one of them, you know? Um, and I feel like I did a great job with my my deal. So um, I think it's it, it depends on who you are, whether you can, you know, go it alone. Okay, crystal ball time. It's January 1st, 2023. And we're looking back on 2022. What did the consolidation landscape look like? Are we going to be sitting there going, oh my God, a thousand more shops were sold this year. And uh, you know what? The market is still ripe right now and there's buyers galore. What do you think, looking back from that date, 2022, what's it going to look like? Gee whiz. I, I don't know because I'm always, you know, in my mind saying, okay, I think this is going to play out. I think that's going to play out. And I'm usually a pretty good forecast, you know, just in business, in life, you know, I, I'm good at assembling facts and, and figuring out, you know, what, you know, things are going to look like. And it has just been such an interesting world that we've lived in, not just for the collision space, but just in general. I mean, just think about all that we've been through as a country, as, you know, a, a, a trade um, in the last, you know, two and a half, three years, you know, it's just been wild. So I really don't know what to say. I do think it's still going to be very bullish, though. That is my, I think we're going to continue to have lots of sellers, lots of buyers, unless war happens. And if war happens, I think that's going to really uh, potentially could change things. But, you know, again, you just don't know what's going to happen until it, it, it kind of plays out, you know. You mentioned in one of the articles you wrote for us that body shop owners, the hardest part for them to selling their shop is thinking, what's next? What am I going to do with my time? And like you said in your article, it's like selling a piece of your soul. What in your estimation is the hardest part about a body shop owner letting, letting go of their baby? Uh, I tell you, um, it's just emotional and, um, you know, for me, you know, I'm a woman, you know, we're supposed to be in touch with our emotions, right? And um, for me, like I cried 
a lot, you know, I mean, I went to my stores about, um, about a year ago, I went to one of them and I literally cried in a parking lot. I mean, it's, it's an emotional journey and men are not always equipped to be emotional. So then when you don't know how to process your emotions, you know, because it's just not who you are, you know, then, you know, it manifests different ways. And, and again, I'm not a psychiatrist, but you know, it's, it's, it's a journey. And, and just like everything in life, I'm a firm believer, you know, it's uh, a purpose for growth, right? So, um, you know, it, it's just another piece of life where we learn and we have takeaway. But I think probably the hardest thing is it's no different than selling one of your kids. Like, that's what I felt like, you know, um, we, we had at the time, I think close to 40 employees, um, most of them, probably at least 30 of them, maybe a couple more than that had been with us, you know, over seven, eight years, you know, so they had become very close to us. And then I think the biggest thing for me personally was a lot of them were really angry. You know, they were upset with us, you know, some of them were really supportive, um, and some of them got over it, some didn't. But I think that was the hardest thing is because some of those people were so close to me, so close to my son, you know, it, it just was really hard. You know, that part was really hard as well. You know, you losing people that were really good friends and, and people you shared your life with, you know? You mentioned a while ago too, something that surprised me and I think something that surprised you was that not only was there not a slowdown in consolidation at the end of last year, shop owners were so desperate to get out that they were willing to take hundreds of thousands of dollars less for their shop for a variety of reasons. You know, they're tired, they're exhausted. You know, COVID was the final nail in the coffin, so to speak. Um, they want to get in while the getting is good. Is that dynamic still going on? Um, I don't think so, so much because last year it was a rat race to get to, you know, 1231, you know, um, and, you know, now the rat race is over, you know, it's not like, you know, you've got a, a true hard deadline. Um, so I don't, I don't see that so much happening. Um, and quite honestly, um, I feel like sellers, not that they've slowed down, they haven't slowed down at all, but they're definitely... Um, and I'm encouraging them to really think through things because this is a big decision. You only do it once. You want to make sure that A, you really want to do it and, and B, you know, once it's done, you can't go back and redo it. You know, if you make a mistake, you know, you think that, you know, oh, hell, I should have did something different, you know. Um, so I really, really encourage them to take the extra time to really, really think it through because um, it, it's, it's, it's permanent, you know. One of the reasons you said that the consolidation market was so healthy and lucrative for body shops is the plethora of buyers uh, in the market. Do you foresee any new buyers coming into the market in this year? I mean, in just the last 60 days, I've made contact with three new ones. I mean, it just, they just keep, you know, popping up. You know what I mean? They just keep popping up. So, I think that, you know, people understand uh, or, or somewhere they're understanding or getting the knowledge that, um, you know, this is an area where they can make money, you know, and it makes sense for them. And as long as that information's out there, I think the reality of that is that you're, you're going to potentially see some more. And, um, but at what rate, who knows? And, um, Ultimately, all these little ones, you know, they're popping up. I mean, there's, you know, I don't know how many, but at least I know of at least 10 or 15 of them. Um, you know, their end game is not to be in the body shop business. Their end game is to sell it to somebody, you know, like, you know, Caliber, Gerber, uh, Crash Champions, Classic, one of, you know, the bigger, uh, you know, consolidators. I, you know, ultimately, that's, that is their end game. I don't know if there's a strict formula out there, but... You know, let's talk about numbers. Let's say a shop organization, they have three shops and each shop does three million in gross sales. Does that mean they can sell that organization for $9 million? Um, I know that in some cases, shops were paid dollar for dollar um, based on their gross sales. What, you know, what can the average shop expect to, to get for their shop based on 
their set their sales. So again, like we talked about earlier, um, when we do the valuation, um, it it's not black and white. I mean, we see sales literally from twenty percent of sales all the way up, you know, to what they call one to one, which is dollar for dollar sales, up to you know, I've seen some, uh, you know, one to you know, one to one point three of sales, you know, thirty uh, percent above what one to one is. Um, so, um, you know, and, and when it gets to those bigger sales, you know, we, we quite frankly don't always get all the details and there's always a lot of other, what we'll call add-ons or, um, uh, padding and different things to entice the deal. Um, and those are usually the really big deals, you know, where it's a, somebody that's got 12 or 20 or, you know, 30, you know, it's these, these bigger, bigger consolidators and, um. And quite honestly, we just don't hear a lot about those deals. It's, it's pretty quiet. Laura, can you give me the average demographic of the typical seller in the body shop world? Sure. So most body shop owners, quite honestly, you know, they are your typical body shop seller. Somebody that's at a ripe age of retirement, um, maybe ladies. Uh, in their 60s and some, quite honestly, in their 70s. I have one right now that's in his 80s. So, you know, the ones that kind of make sense. Um, but quite honestly, there's a lot of sellers out there right now that are falling into like the 40s. You know, I've got a lot of 40-somethings that are, that are looking to sell. And, you know, obviously their plan's different. You know, they're, they're not ready to retire and they're going to go in. A lot of them are looking at going into different, you know, businesses. I've got one that wants to do a boat charters and I have another that uh, wants to have an ADOS company, you know, that does, uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to, I think they're going to have a stationary ADOS business. Um, I have another um, that is uh, wanting to do like restoration work. Um, and then I have uh, another that's out doing um, uh business consulting, but not consulting to like the collision industry, like anybody that needs consulting, you know, maybe more like a coaching or mentoring. Um, so it's really cool to see all of these people, including myself, I was 42 when I sold, um, you know, reinvent themselves, quite honestly. Laura, as we know, selling your shop is like selling a piece of your soul and the employees uh, that you have are like family. Um, what can you say to a shop owner who's concerned about the future of their employees and how they're going to be treated um, going forward after they sell their shop? That's obviously got to be a legitimate concern. Um, what can you say about that? So it's a very legitimate concern. And I will tell you that every single seller I deal with, that is probably in their top two concerns. Uh, probably what I'm going to get for it and what, what about my people? Um, and I think that just speaks volumes of who these people are. And um, quite honestly, that really depends on who buys them, you know, how that post sale looks like. Um, at the end of the day, every single consolidator, you know, they want to keep every single employee contrary to popular thought of, uh, of shop employees, these consolidators don't have a warehouse of people on standby waiting to bring them in and, and take their jobs. Um, but what happens is if consolidators come in, some do a great job of um, managing the integration and uh, culture and the changes. And some do, quite frankly, an awful job. And the ones that do an awful job lose a lot of people. Um, and it's it's really um, it's really uh, when I say it's bipolar, it really it really depends on the buyer. And I also think buyers probably go through a lot of challenges too because they're growing so fast and trying to maintain culture. Um, you know where they started, where they are now. I mean, they sh they have the exact same struggles the consolidators do that we do as a single shop owner. So can you imagine trying to multiply that by 250 shops or a thousand shops or 1500 shops? Um, it's tough. So um, 
I, I really just think right now it really uh, comes down to who is the buyer and how their integration process is and how seamless it is. Um, but I would say to employees that are listening to this, honestly, truly, 100%, the consolidators want every one of you to stay. You had said at one point in one of your articles you wrote for us that um, at, in, in, at, at, the, at the end of this, you feel like there's going to be maybe two big brands left, kind of like uh, the home improvement space, like Lowe's and Home Depot. Do you still feel that way? I think there probably is. You know, there might be three, there might be four, but I think it's going to be that. And then I think we're going to have those independent shops that we talked about earlier. You know, the ones that are, are you know, delivering to what I'll call maybe a higher end client, um, you know, kind of like, I don't want to say like the Mercedes client, because that's not right. Because there's plenty of people that drive Toyotas that still want that same type of service, you know that what I'll call that old world service. Laura, I'm sure one of the reasons that shops are uh, reevaluating whether they want to move forward with their shop or not right now is uh, uh, the increased investment they're going to have to make and the liability that's increasing with these highly sophisticated vehicles. Do you find that those are, you know, that liability factor and the investment they're going to have to make, are those two big strong factors in, 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 in shaping shops future right now? Absolutely. Um, a lot of shop owners really, quite honestly, are at a crossroads. You know what I mean? They're, you know, are they going to take the road of, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to spend and invest quite a bit of money in equipment, uh, retooling, retraining employees, uh, a lot of expense in uh, continuing education, um, again, I, I mentioned earlier about the niche, just really getting a niche. Um, all of that stuff, you know, that, that, that is a cost of doing business and it, and it costs a lot of money to, to get that, to get there. And so there's a lot of people that are truly identifying and realizing that. And that is another huge motivating factor for a lot of shop owners. Um, do, do, you know, do they have the, the emotional and mental wherewithal to do it? And more importantly, do they have the financial wherewithal? And I imagine um, also as a factor right now is the, the squeeze these guys are under profit-wise. I mean, labor is getting more expensive. Materials are getting more expensive. That's got to be a factor too, right? It absolutely is. And I think the biggest factor with that is the cost of all of these materials you know, it's going up just like we go to the grocery store and we buy a loaf of bread and, you know, a gallon of milk. I mean, literally, I feel like every time I go to the grocery store, it's another 20 cents more. It's another 20 cents more. Well, that same thing is translating into the collision space. And again, we talk about, you know, body shop owners that are former body men and former painters they don't have the knowledge or understanding on how to figure out, you know, what is my new break even? What is, what is, what do I need to make my, what do my new labor rates need to be? How do I combat this? And then you have insurers that don't want to give rate increases or they're very slow to get it, or they don't realize or understand or appreciate, you know, how the cost of materials and labor has gone up. Um, and that's also been a challenge is labor. Um, I don't know if you've seen or heard this, but there's some shops, um, independents and consolidators that are given five and $10,000 sign on bonuses. I mean, just nutty things to get people on board. And I mean, clearly we cannot continue to sustain this. I mean, there's just not that kind of profit in our industry to do that. Um, I mean, we've been repressed for a long time. I mean, I, I, you know, thinking back, I feel like, you know, the labor rates have been truly terribly repressed for 10 years in most of the country, you know? So um, I think all of these things are, are just, again, you know, more re things that are raising the temperature of why so many people are just like, you know, I just don't have the emotional wherewithal. I don't have the financial wherewithal. And, and I really need to get out or, or I, I want out maybe. 
Laura, thank you so much for being on Body Shop Business, the podcast. I think we're in for a really exciting year as far as consolidation. Like you said in one of your articles, this could make for the next great Netflix series. It's like a soap opera, right? There's so much drama, the deal making, the near deals, the broken deals, the sealed deals. It's going to be really exciting. And we really look forward to you updating our readers on the pages of Body Shop Business. Thank you, Jason, so much for giving me the opportunity to be part of keeping uh, the, the folks of the collision world in the know of what's going on. I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. I certainly did enjoy every minute of it. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Body Shop Business, the podcast. Check out BodyShopBusiness.com for more podcasts.